The music sure hypes me up. Gets me ready for the presentation, that's for sure. Hello, Monica Pharaoh. All right, a lot of familiar names. As Mark Cakes veterans know, we're getting a lot more new new people are joining. They're joining, and uh, you know, some of them get escorted out the door. They hit they hit that wall of cognitive dissonance, and they say things they don't have to. And uh, I show them the exit, and it seems like my my new little program of releasing a lot of shorts, which I've never really done before. I've done shorts on on, on trips. You guys know playing a video game, Big Mint, Big John and I out in North Carolina or San Diego or Galveston. I'll do a short to let you guys know what's going on, where I'm at. I'm in route. I've never made a habit of doing shorts out of my content ever. Started doing it two days ago. I have I, I have 70 or 80 shorts already prepared. I just, I don't feel like it's, I don't feel like it's, it's a, uh, I don't know. I don't want to say ethical. I just. Doesn't feel right to me to just to just blitzkrieg shorts out there. Although I have them already, I could do that, but <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, a few announcements. One, I did say I was going to sh show you guys these spoons. I believe I've showed them before. I did a, I did a post today. It's uh it's just so sad that all these old catalogs. I have a whole I have a whole cabinet right here full of old catalogs from the eighteen eighties, nineties, all the way to nineteen twenties. Uh, Sears Roebuck catalogs. I've showed them on my channel. Show you guys that it's it's we don't have this quality anymore. We don't have people making these things. I showed pictures of some of these these spoons with these engravings on the inside, just like I showed, just like in that post. Yeah, guys, these these are real silver. These are part of my collection, but these were common. These are common items, little teaspoons, common items. Companies, engravers. Manufacturers, they took pride in their stuff. They took pride. Yeah, it's just crazy. Yeah, somebody wanted me to show that because I did that post. Uh, great topic of discussion today. Our world was quite literally, the entire infrastructure of our society today was built on the backs of mariners. We're going to be talking about that. You're going to hear things in this video you've never heard before. Uh, some of the stuff I pulled straight out of my Chronicon. I've been going through Chronicon for days. I have to because Shiva Shampoo was a part of a team, an international team. Um, uh, Baybet, Baybet Pullman, um, Don, uh, Don Koch, Kosh. I'm not really sure how to say his last name. But these three and maybe a fourth that worked with them that I don't know of worked on this project for over a year and a half and uh chronicon was huge but i i i while i appreciate it and chronicon is awesome and i'm going to show it to you in a post i'll probably photograph it today it filled three giant three ring binders the rings on these binders are this big so chronicon's 1052 pages but i don't believe it's done and uh, that's why I have another 800 pages on the side of all these research notes. I have to, I have to now, and this takes time. I have to now compare my stack because I know Baybet Pullman had access to some of this, and she incorporated it in Chronicon. I'm hoping she incorporated most, but it's not her fault if she didn't. It just means I didn't send everything because didn't have. I didn't know where it was. I'm still finding. I'm still finding all kinds of research from boxes and. I'm going through all my old stuff and I and I, I uh, things that are not important to me at the at the present. I'll look at them and shelve them and then and I'll just put them in a box. Now I'm, uh, I went through all my paperwork from prison, all my notes I'm going through. And I'm like, oh my god. And Don Don said something to me that that's got it's got me reeling, but I'm thinking it may be necessary. Um. I have so much research data and I have, I have things that I haven't even put on YouTube. I got so much stuff. I don't know how quite I'm going to do it because it's going to take a lot of my time. And that means uh, there's no way I'm going to do this for free. This is something that I would have to charge for. I don't know how much, but she put it in my mind that it, it's kind of necessary to put a syllabus together 
and do an archaics university and do it like a real university where people can select the things that they're interested in called electives. And yet there's core material. And we, we already put together a program fast. I'm talking about when I, when I get new ideas, I process them fast. Overnight, I'd already thought about it and said, you know what? We can have uh, Archaics University graduate coins minted. And you can't even purchase these coins if you don't actually fulfill three of the four sem sem uh, semesters. I mean, this is going to be a lot of downloaded material, PDFs, me presentations of me. Uh, giving the lessons. Uh, I'm going to show all kinds of things like uh, actual actual citations from books. I mean, photographs. We're going to we're going to go through material, how to research things. Uh, uh, we'll do a whole we'll do whole things on different calendrical systems, uh, isometric projections. Actually, show people how to how to do the uh, uh, the isometric projections, and then to verify them using pi phi and curvature equations to make sure that they, they got it right because there are ghost projections that you have to avoid. So all this, this it just overnight, I just got deluged with all these ideas that someone could graduate from Archaics University doing three semesters, although I will offer four because those who take the fourth semester, each one being three months long, those are the ones that are, that are going to get a, a special medallion. Those are the ones who are going to actually get a certificate certified from me that they are on the level to start their own social media, and we will we will give them all the books, all the all the teaching materials, everything they need to do to start their own study groups, and they will have the certificate and a medallion that shows that they they uh, were approved by Jason of Archaics because they they did the full year tuition. Uh, but you can just graduate and get the get the coin, the Archaics University graduate coin for taking three semesters of things that you want to take, that you're interested in. But for those who want the extra to where we're going to be involved in making sure you have all the materials you need from Archaics in order for you to start teaching, for you to start holding classes, for you to start your YouTube channels or, or, or whatever you're trying to do for you to do your Netflix series, whatever it is you want to do to get endorsed by me officially, legally, you would have to graduate the whole program. And uh, I'm already putting, I'm already putting the syllabus together. I'm going to publish it on YouTube so you guys can see here's all the courses. Every course has downloadable lessons. Uh, yeah. These semesters, you will be tested. You will be tested, but I'm just thinking that this is the way to go. Um, I'm even going to have a debate. I'm even going to have a debate. I, a lot of the newer people don't know this. They just don't know this about me. But I spent years in prison studying studying Cicero. And um, I used to go through all the Toastmaster material. And uh, I wasn't in Toastmasters, but I know guys that were. And they used to give me all their materials. And so when it comes to debate, I've been holding back because I've just been waiting for that for that giant to step forward, thinking that they're that they're qualified to contend with all my data sets and my ability to to convey them. But I haven't had a taker yet, so it's a uh, it's getting to the point where I just don't care. I may go ahead and one of the electives will be uh, on uh, expertise on oratory, what you need to know on how to win arguments, how to win them with with inescapable points and how to teach lessons employing the Socratic method in order that people will have their aha moments on their own by being presented with materials that they can't wrap their minds around any way out as opposed to you just telling them something and then emotion is involved and people get triggered because because they don't they're, they're not accepting the material because it may be something about your personality, something about the way you look, something about your voice, something about your background. You understand? So anyway, <clears throat> I'm a, this is what's going on right now. And it all happened at the same time as Don was watching me with paperwork spread out all over the entire uh, area. And I had so much paperwork and everything's a different subject matter. I mean, I got so many things. I mean, just the Israelite migrations alone maybe have may have to be uh, uh, remedial and advanced. 
I didn't even realize until I pulled the folder out. I have so many archaeological and historical and biblical citations for just where the 10 lost tribes of Israel finally settled and who they are today. I had forgotten I had that much research. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little overwhelmed right now going through all my data. And it's a little, it's a little humbling to realize that that uh, this much research was done, and I just com I just shelved it. I just once I was done with something, I just put it in the envelope, put it away, put it in the envelope, put it away, and come to find out, I mismarked a bunch of envelopes, or I shoved paperwork, I shoved packets of paperwork in envelopes that had been used for something else in the past. So later, like a couple years ago, and, and six months ago, when I did when I went through all my files, I only looked at the envelopes thinking I understood what their contents were and they weren't. Only only in the past four or five days have I emptied everything from every envelope and then emptied the contents of envelopes that were in within envelopes. And guys, you got some videos coming on some of this stuff. I just totally forgot I did the research. I mean, that's how I was in prison. I just read books, ob absorbed this material. A lot of the stuff we're talking about now is some of this new stuff I found in the in the uh, uh in my boxes. So yeah, this is this is where it's going. We're gonna have to do an arcade university, and we're gonna have to start uh, networking with people who want to to be official uh, uh, arcades group hosts. Uh, I'll, I, you know what? I have no problem calling you deans. We may even put that on the on the coins themselves. Uh, arcades dean with certificate um, uh, signed with me. Um, we're gonna figure it out. If you guys have some good ideas on how on how to do that. Because we need to make it official. Because many people are going to be able to get through my three month deals. People are just curious. You want to know? You want to learn a lot? Okay, that's what the three week. That's what the. I mean, excuse me. That's what the uh, three semester. Uh, that's what the three semesters is for. The grad, the graduate level. You know, um, uh, three semesters is for. But the fourth semester, I, I assure you, it's not. It's going to be only for our case veterans. It's only going to be for those who are who are seriously getting deep involved in this. Because because the fourth semester, you're going to have to earn that real, uh, with some real. Uh, you got to get your nose in the books, and uh. We'll also have a new tool that we're going to use. You know the archaic search feature that's on my web page on my on my archaic site. Okay. Many of you have noticed that it quit working. Well, it's working again. So this uh, it also has new functions. It has new features. We'll be incorporating that, that system as well in the Archaics University because you're able to use that to find anything on my 600 and something videos. So anyway, this is just what, what we're doing. Uh, uh, this is, I'm just overwhelmed a little bit. Also, I got uh, 300 and something copies of my books. So if you want to order books, I got here's all six of them that are provided by Book Tree. The seventh one is a uh, the seventh one. Here's Awaken the Immortal Within, my bestseller. Lost Scriptures of Giza, my very first published book that introduces you to a, a whole bunch of just a whole bunch of archaic concepts. My first book on the Phoenix phenomenon. Then my second book on the Phoenix phenomenon. Then my first book on the Anunnaki. And correcting all the calendrical misinformation put out by Zechariah Sitchin. And then this is Return of the Fallen Ones. But you guys have seen the small version. This is the large version that just came out, though. It had to be republished in this format because it's got 30 or 40 something charts in there that my publisher inserted. Crystal clear charts to help you understand the chronology of the Anunnaki, the ancient world, the Mayan long count, how all this stuff went down in the ancient world. It's all the, the whole middle section is nothing but charts now. So it was it was republished just recently. My seventh book, my book tree, is being published right now. It should be available within two weeks. This is my Nephilim book. Uh, my book called uh, uh Something Giants. I can't even remember the name of my own book. I've written so, wrote, written so many of them. So that covers that. Yeah, Chronicon is overwhelming me right now. Dave, I did the same thing. I didn't leave my research. I left all my books in prison. Dave here says I left all my research in prison for the people there. But uh, truth is, I left all my books 
thousands of books. Because over the years, I had to trade for more books. And then I, I'd give whole stacks of books to people as I got more in the mail. And benefactors would send me books. And then I'd also get books from different prisoners. And I'd get, I'd get books from the, from the prisons themselves and the libraries. And I told you stories about that. But, yeah, I always data mined everything and took a bunch of notes. So the book had no value to me anymore. I had the notes. And that's what Shiva Shampoo and Don Koch and Bay Bed had. They had they had thousands of data points all in my notes that had to be collated, organized in chronological order, and inserted where they go in Chronicon. So that's what I'm checking right now. I'm making sure Chronicon has all the stuff I sent them, yet I'm also finding I got some stuff over here on the side that, that was never introduced. The problem is, is I have to finish with this whole stack of 800 pages to make sure I know how much wasn't introduced, and then I got to figure out how to get it all in there as fast as possible. Never ends, guys. Never ends. The more I accomplish, the more I have to do. Yeah, yeah. Graduates of Archaic University, you're going to have my my private notes. That's part of the graduation. You're going to have my private notes on how to overcome any of these arguments from any of these people in Ancient Aliens, those who promote Graham Hancock's version of history, Billy Carson's uh, version of history. You're going to have all the full data sets, easy to see. You'll be able, you will be able to debate anyone because the facts don't lie. And a calculator doesn't lie. And when you put the two together, then anybody who was to oppose that and continue to believe what they want to believe is now doing it because they're more, and it's more cult-like behavior. They're not actually using their, their heads. This is all this misinformation that's out there. It's out there because there hasn't been someone like me all in these people's face trying to make back them up to against the wall. And that's what I'm going to do. 2024 is all about that. 2024 just started, but I promise you, Mr. Hancock and Mr. Carson and others just like them are, are sooner or later, they're going to have to deal with archaics. There's no way to keep running because sooner or later, if there's going to come a tipping point where they realize, OK, we got to do something about this guy because he is tearing our house apart. And so I'm going to continue to do that with, with respect and a smile on my face. So anyway. Um, yeah, I think that, I think I covered all that. The meetup, the tickets for the meetup, somebody can put them in the, yeah, Giants on Ancient Earth. That's the name of the book. It's been reformatted, edited, real polished up, real nice. And Booktree's releasing it as a book. It was a private book I, I, I self-published. Booktree picked it up. Right after that, they're going to publish, uh, the pre-flood world, which is the first one-fifth of Chronicon. It's huge. Just that one book is huge. That'll be published this year as well. Yeah, all orders, you can easily go, you can easily go to any one of my prior videos. I don't know if I got them in, in the description box here, but any one of my prior videos will show you uh, how to order anything. And how to get all my free downloads. I got a lot of free stuff. One free breaker is asking about Archaics University. Look, I, I talked about in the beginning. It's, it's real simple. It's going to be a one-year graduate course. Nine months for those who just want the graduate coin. And to be able to say that they graduated Archaics University Tier 1. But the tier two is, is going to be advanced and it's going to be a medallion, a certificate, and it will it's kind of like legally binding archaics to those who graduate so they can uh so they can promote archaics, they can be they can be titled officially as a dean of archaics, and they can begin teaching, and we will provide them all their materials that they need. But those are for those who go through all four semesters. It's still embryonic, guys. It's still embryonic. But we got a lot done in one day after after this this was, you know, she mentioned this. Now, <clears throat> so uh a few people noted a few a few people mentioned in the chat before this video came came on that Ship of Fools was something that was particular to uh Matt of Quantum of Conscious consciousness or qu conscience listen 
I like the guy. I've listened to three, maybe four of his presentations while I'm in my wood shop or while I'm doing different things uh, with my hands. I, I listen to different YouTubers. Um, you know what? Uh, I've got absolutely, absolutely no criticism of the guy. He's got a different, he's got a slightly different message, different platform, different type of community. And uh, so there's crossover between, between us. I, I agree. Um, he's kind of a, uh, he's kind of antisocial. And that's a good thing. Uh, I'm not. I'm not being critical. But if, if ship of fools is something he's doing, I just want to let you guys know I'm not stepping on his toes. I have no idea what you're talking about. That uh, Matt has some type of show involving ship of fools. I, I merely name this ship of fools because we're going to be talking about some deep maritime stuff. You see, in the pre-flood world, in the pre-flood world, we have evidence of ships. As a matter of fact, there is a ship. Per, oh, it, it was almost perfectly intact interred basically entombed right next to the great pyramid on the giza plateau why would a ship be buried in a vault that was designed for a ship a huge vault right next to the great pyramid i'm going to tell you why because someone in the ancient world wanted you to bridge two concepts one of them was the ship that carries vital, important things for survival from one destination to another. That's what ships were, were for. It's a concept. This is where we got our ark concept. Put all your worldly possessions, put all the important things to, to secure future civilization, get it all protected on this vast ark because we're about to ride through a tumultuous period. We're about to ride through a very dark period, but we're going to come out intact with everything while every everybody on the outside of the ark didn't fare too well. For those who don't know, in my book right here, Lost Scriptures of Giza, written 20 years ago, published in 2006, I explained that the concept of ark was also attached to the Great Pyramid of Egypt, but it was a different type of ark. And I itemize many of the traditions, not all, because I've discovered more, but I have itemized many of the traditions from the ancient world that describe that the Great Pyramid of Egypt was a type of ark that preserved geodetic, geometric, astronomical, and general knowledge encoded within its dimensions. And this is exactly what we have found since the days of Robert Menzies and John Taylor, when they published in the 1870s and 1860s their theory about the Great Pyramid having all the universal measures, which was picked up by Charles Piazzi Smith, Astronomer Royale for Scotland. So alarming was this to the scientific community that they dispatched a giant in the field of science named Sir Flinders Petrie who went and studied the Great Pyramid and measured everything using a micrometer. Many of his measurements are published to the thousandths of an inch. He was very, very thorough. This is Sir Flinders Petrie. Then engineer David Davidson, Adam Rutherford, uh, H. Alder Smith, Sir, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, e. Raymond Capt, and many others I'm not mentioning. Even Noah Hutchings of Southwest Radio Church in Oklahoma City got on board, wrote a good book on the pyramid. Many researchers have come forth and showed this advanced mathematics, calendrics. They have showed how the Great Pyramid is associated to calendars. But in many of these books, they all refer to the Great Pyramid as an ark. It was specifically designed to carry through important vital data to a future generation that would survive way after the predicted cataclysm. The predicted cataclysm did, a, did happen, and we know because we have no records of the ancient world beyond the 22nd century BC. Nothing. Everything we know from the 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th, all the way to the 38th century BC, everything that we know in the traditional archaeological historical record comes from oral traditions that were then put into cuneiform and then four and five hundred years later put into alphabet 
in the Middle East, we don't have original texts from any original events that ever happened pre-cataclysm. Not a single one. That world was destroyed. The Great Pyramid as an ark has preserved information for us in the last days. Now, the decode of the of the Great Pyramid, how it refers to all the calendars of the ancient world and how these pinpoint future dates in our calendar, this is all covered in just one of my playlists. My, my Great Pyramid, my Lost Secrets of Giza playlist. It's not the subject matter of this video. I just wanted to explain why there was a giant ship interred right next to the Great Pyramid. Because both of them serve as a con serve to identify the concept of ark. This is what they were. One preserves life and the provisions that are necessary for life. You put all your food and grain and cereals and animals in the hull. Yeah. And the other preserves important knowledge. Knowledge of time, space, and knowledge of the world that that, that time and space is relative to, to the observer. That's the Great Pyramid. Both of them are arcs. Mm -mm. Oh, see, I never did an audio check, did I? But I know it's good because you guys aren't, aren't getting on my ass. All right. Yeah, Jamie Robbins, that's the whole... That's the whole sub that's the whole reason why we have mythological periods. The those people weren't primitive in the way they lived. Their frames of reference were primitive because their infrastructures had collapsed. And hundreds of years later, people were trying to retell stories without having any idea that these were technologically advanced situations that they were describing. They didn't know. Yeah, we, we've been technologically advanced multiple times, guys. Remember, it only takes 200 years to go from horse and buggy to Hadron Collider. There's a lot of lacunas in, in the historical record, and Archaics is determined to, to fill those with accurate information. Not this BS coming out of ancient aliens and uh, the uh, Zechariah Sitchin type material in, in the, in the Atlantis' 9,600 B.C. drivel. So... With the fall of the technolithic period, no more technology, the arcs, remember in prior presentations, I showed you guys that it's not, it wasn't one arc. The Jews in Babylon invented the Noah's Ark scenario based off of stories that were circulating in the Babylonian libraries that, was, that were available to them during their captivity. It wasn't one arc. Even Ignatius Donnelly admits in the 1880s when he was doing his research that he come across data that was the ancient world was felling forests to build fleets of arcs. Yeah. And that in that structure that looks like a giant boat on the slopes of Mount Ararat in Armenia or Turkey, whichever one it's in, is a uh, that may be just one of those arcs. And the story of Noah was attached to that because that one was found when, when it's not necessarily true. So with the fall of the techno, with the fall of technolithic society, we had the rise of heliolithic culture. And it didn't take but about 200 years for Heliolithic culture, which venerated the sun and built monuments that are aligned to the sun. The Heliolithic megalithic builders were very sophisticated. They were also post-technolithic, meaning they still had access to some of the technolithic, technolithic technologies, and they were using them to build their own infrastructure. Evidence of this is all throughout South America. Anybody who has seen a bunch of, a bunch of images of ruins in South America will see laser precision cut boulders, upside down staircases, all kinds of weird architectural features carved in the side of Andes Mountains. And it's nothing but practice runs. All around, none of it makes sense because it wasn't designed to make sense. 
men were standing there using technologies that they were trying to get a hold of and trying to become experts with because the technolithic pre-cataclysm period was gone. Now, after the cataclysm, they had basically rebuilt the old technologies, but, but they were inferior. And their knowledge of how to use the old technology was inferior as well. And this is why we have what we have in South America. Whole areas have been identified by archaeologists as anomalous. They don't understand. But I do. When you look at it, you can see what it is. Half-finished and unfinished projects, things that things where the pitch was off and they had to make their corrections, uh, different cuts in different areas, upside-down staircases that make absolutely no, no sense and don't go anywhere and never were meant to because these were practice runs. They're using a technology to cut into rock, to melt and smooth over rock, to fuse boulders together. They were doing, they were doing all that in South America after the cataclysm in the first 200 years. And it was during this period that gave rise to the Heliolithic Maritime Empire, which was called the Archaic Civilization by W.J. Perry in his fascinating book, uh, The Children of the Sun. Remember, I've quoted this book many times. After 551 pages of archaeological data on uh, on an archaic civilization that was sailing ships to cities made of stone all over the world, dynasties that referred to themselves as children of the sun. All of a sudden, according to him, about this is a direct quote about the year 1688 BC, every single Bronze Age civilization in the world disappeared. That's amazing because 1687 BC was the Ogygian deluge. It was, it was one of the worst Phoenix visitations we have in the entire 138 year timeline of the Phoenix that, that, that that's coming again in May of 2040. So this was 552 years after the great flood that the Heliolithic Maritime Empire collapsed. I have five videos on my channel on the Ogygian Deluge. If you have not watched them, you have no idea how incredibly destructive this event was. And it explains all the megalithic ruins that have, megalithic ruins that have been found in South America, Central America, North America, all throughout Northern Africa, the entire Mediterranean basin, all around the Levant, going all the way to to uh, 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 Tibet, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, all the way through southern China uh, in, in, into Australia. The Heliolithic Maritime Empire was trading all around the world. This was, They were connected to Easter Island. All throughout Melanesia, Polynesia, and Micronesia, they were everywhere. These five videos cover a single day. All five videos cover a single day in the month of May of the year 1687 BC. And all the ancient historians and, 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 and monuments and authors that have left us records about that terrible time, which started a 25 year darkness. Science agrees and says that around 1650 BC, it seems like the entire ancient world started waking up after, some, after a long period of a hiatus, a lacuna. Scientific, all the scientific books, all the encyclopedias will tell you about that. They will tell you that around 1650, it seems like Egypt, Babylon, China, the uh, uh, civilizations in the Americas, all the Mediterranean, just all of a sudden decided to start waking up and rebuilding. Yeah, because the sun reappeared, just like the America says. It's the sun calendars. Yeah, we're finding more and more evidence in archaics, and I'll be I'll be revealing this uh, sh soon. But we're finding more and more evidence that these vapor canopies come fast, and they last for 25, 30 years, and they go just that just long enough for a whole generation of giants to be born, and then they're gone. Yeah, we see it. We've seen it again in 522 A.D. with the Justinian darkness that lasted 30 years, 25 years. So anyway, oh, uh, hey pops, I see I see Dad in the chat. But, uh, yeah, matter of fact, I think we're going to have lunch tomorrow, Dad. I'll be passing by. So, anyway, um, 
Yeah, so that was the uh, 1687 B BC. The Heliolithic Maritime Empire is mentioned in this video here because it was a maritime empire. All, all the civilizations of the old Bronze Age were, were advanced post-technolithic. They were building cities out of stone we can't do today. However, the mode of transportation all around the world were wooden ships. The type of wooden ships that they used were very different than ships that came after. But they were ocean-going vessels. And they were very seaworthy because they could, carry, they could carry a lot of people, a lot of cargo, a, a vast amount of weight. We don't know, we hardly know anything about the Heliolithic Maritime Empire. And the only evidence of their existence are legends, traditions, and hundreds of megalithic cities that were abandoned at the same time where archaeologists are baffled that the workshops, work tables, tools, hammers, chisels were all left for archaeologists to find. Why? Because in the Ogygian deluge started with earthquakes when Phoenix first appeared before the darkness appeared, all the laborers in all hundreds of megalithic sites around the world ran for their lives. They dropped their tools right there. And that's what I reveal in those five videos. All the sites where archaeologists have been baffled that the tools were laid there. Because in ancient times, you lose a tool, you lose a hand. Yeah, you lose a couple tools, they'll kill you. Yeah, tools were just as valuable. Just like the story in the book of Jasher when they were building the Tower of Babel, if a man was carrying a brick all up the up the ramps to be added to the Tower of Babel. And if he if he made it to the top and he wasn't holding his brick, he was cast off the tower to die. Because they walked single file up, up the ramp. Single file. And if you dropped your brick and you showed up at the top of that tower and you weren't still holding on to your brick, then they killed you. Just like that. Yeah. The bricks were worth more than the people, the people who were carrying them. Anyway, so also right here on my channel in my reset in mud, mud flood videos, these videos can only be found on my Phoenix Phenomenon playlist, but you will learn of four archaeological discoveries of ships that have all been found underneath mountains, underground by miners or rock slides, rock slides that have completely revealed a whole cavern and have been studied by people. Four ships that have been found underground. You will learn also about a ship that was that was located in the middle of Death Valley in the United States, where local Indians would would charge Westerners to go to give them a tour, to take them all the way out there to go see this ship in the middle of the sand of the desert in Death Valley. Also where Bedouins and Moors would give tours to a tourist to take them out to a wooden ship of Phoenician origin in the middle of the Sahara Desert, where tourists could go look in the 1800s and early, early 20th century, and they could go look, and the skeletons were still chained to the, to, to the, to the uh, decking. Yeah, a ship that's way. Remember, that used to be the Triton Sea. Sahara Desert's new, guys. It's new. Within the last 3,600 years, it's it's relatively new. Diodorus, Siculus, and Strabo revealed that the whole, whole of North Africa used to be called the Triton Sea. When it drained out, revealing the Sphinx. Remember, the Sphinx was under, under the Mediterranean. Yeah, don't believe that Robert Schock. He might be a great guy, a geologist and all that. Don't believe that theory. That theory they got that the Sphinx is 10,000 B.C. and all, it's all bogus B.S. It's all... The Sphinx got water damage because it was not protected by white limestone casing blocks like all three pyramids were protected with casing blocks. The Sphinx was unprotected and was under the Mediterranean for 340 years. I have several videos explaining this, how Egypt was anciently caused, called the raised land because it raised out of the waters and other traditions and legends that remember that Egypt was underwater. So, yeah, don't, don't fall for that BS, guys. All those theories sound real nice. And Robert Shock and Robert Bobble and Graham Hancock, they've made a pretty penny off this off this nice uh, unsubstantiated theory, but 
But, uh, yeah, I'll be addressing that in the future too, man. Those guys got to come to the table. I'm not, I'm not letting it go. Let's see. Yeah, I've covered that. So make sure my chat, I'm keeping up with my chat. All right. So we have many of the traditions. Remember now, we have two resets we're dealing with. Why is it so hard to put back the history of the world? Let me explain why. First of all, there were no written records in the antediluvian period. No one wrote, no one did it, none of that, none of that. We don't have any evidence of writing. What we have is evidence of high technology, high sophistication. This is why I call it the technolithic period. I believe they had technology just like we did. They used tablets. Those little bags that they used to carry, Sumerian bags, may have may have been a device inside of it, and it was so important it was protected in that bag. That bag may have been armored. I don't know. It may have held what the ancients referred to in retrospect, ex post facto mythology, as the Tablets of Destinies, which were, which were in Sumerian texts were called the Mies. The Mies were little devices that allowed you to communicate. They allowed, they allowed you to do all kinds of things. They allowed you to move objects, call, call air support, have things drop from the sky. They were to communicate with other gods. Yeah. This is cargo cult phenomenon. This is what was going on in the ancient world when a superior, a superior culture, the Anuna, came in contact with a primitive culture, which referred to themselves as the black-headed people. Dark hair, dark eyes, olive skin, long, straight black hair. So this is a... a we don't have any written records from the pre the, the technolithic period before 2239 BC because they didn't need to. It was all technological. Just like me writing a text right here, having my information in the cloud, I have PDF copies that are all accessible by my phone. Yeah, it's the same way they lived as well. They were technologically advanced. They, didn't have, they, they were so technologically advanced that, that they didn't preserve any, any paper copies that we know of. Or, or, or any hard hard copies. And if they did, it would have been in the form of discs. And I'm talking about the, the I'm talking about the uh, cobalt discs that have been found in China and all kinds of other little artifacts that we wouldn't be able to recognize or how to extract that data from today. Maybe even crystals. We just don't know how to get that data out today. Perhaps it was holographic. Maybe their information is still in the field and it's accessible. We just gotta have the right codes. The, the right passes to access that information. Some of you mystics call it the Akashic field. I call it the informed field. It doesn't matter. We're talking basically about the same thing. So after 2239 BC, all of a sudden we have pictogram. We have all we have all these uh, methods of communication. We have the pre, we have the uh, proto uh, cuneiform. We have different different cultures are trying to find different ways to communicate. And they're using tablets, which is so weird. They're literally copying the technology from the pre-flood world, but it's not technologically advanced anymore. Now it's primitive. And they're putting their information on tablets, which is something that was a part of their memory. So this is why they, they use the, ta the tablet method. So, And they would burn the, the clay tablets in kilns to harden them, to preserve them. And then they would put them in libraries. And libraries had these vast tablet tablets on display and there were in and there was colophons on the tablets that would allow somebody to know when a tablet series ended because the very last statement of a tablet would refer back to the beginning when the, when the omega text always referred to the alpha text the reader of a series of tablets would know that that series of tablets was done and they could move on to the next it was an independent writing this is something different because it would have its own colophon and it would refer back to its beginning so this is the system that they had in the old in the old Near Eastern libraries. This was all post every bit of this was post cataclysm, meaning all these historical texts, all these mythological texts on the Anuna and the Anunnaki are all post cataclysm. These are oral traditions that were that were preserved and put in writing hundreds of years after the events they depict. 
So when we have a goddess named Ishtar who has to solve a problem, and the only way she can solve it is by passing through a gate to the underworld, mythologically, it sounds it sounds like a, just a god on a mission going to the underworld to do something. But that's not what was happening. We know by virtue of our research in archaics that the underworld was actually a technologically advanced infrastructure and that the resets only happened on the surface. In the underworld, knowledge was preserved. Culture, DNA, everything was preserved. And after these resets, we have the evidence in archaics that someone from the underworld, a benefactor or someone who wants to continue culture and continue uh, continue um, knowledge or whatever, the chain of custody on information, they would release new translations to older texts. They would release technologies that were released to things that had never been harmed in the underworld, but on the surface they'd cease to exist. Primitives had been knocked back. Humans had been knocked back to become more primitive. Someone in the underworld unleashes all these technologies again, and, and, they, and humans start back over. And then there's an agitator, and something doesn't like this, and it causes it induces another reset. This happened in 1687 BC. The Heliolithic Maritime Empire exploded with, with innovation, built all these cities. You cannot think that these people were not technologically advanced who put Puma Punka together, Tiwanaku, Tiwanaku, and all these pyramid cities. All these pyramid cities were replicating an ancient knowledge. They knew the importance of the pyramid. They knew the pyramid had something to do with human survival. They replicated the pyramid everywhere. Many of them replicated the features. Many pyramids in the Americas replicate the height, but in a different dimension of arithmetic, in a different species of measurement. We find this everywhere with 138 feet, 138 meters, 138 uh, 138 dragon heads displayed on a pyramid. Over and over and over, ideas and concepts that we find in Giza with the Great Pyramids, which were built by the Anuna in a technologically advanced society, the memories were carried through the 2239 BC Great Flood event. Then the memories were carried through again after all that was preserved in writing. And then a reset happened in 1687 BC that destroyed the entire world. And now all these mythologic myths and traditions are, are people still remember the oral traditions and remember what they had read and survived. Survivors now are telling the stories, and now everything gets watered down again. Two or three layers of, of, of this happened because in 1135 BC, another systemic reset happened. And this one, this one right here happens so bad, we hardly have any records of the destruction. We just have a lot of records of what appeared in the, in the sky. This is the Atlantis story. This is the Sea People Federation story. In 1135 BC started the Great Mediterranean Dark Age. But what I have shown in Archaics is that actually began a worldwide Dark Age. What's the common denominator here? Well, I'm going to tell you. 2239 BC is 552 years to 1687 BC. This is the Phoenix cycle that was so feared in the ancient world. 552 years is four appearances of the phoenix. It's 138 times four. 552 years after the entire destruction of the old Bronze Age civilizations in 1687 BC, the Ogygian Deluge, 552 years after that was 1135 BC. The, the beginning of the great Mediterranean Dark Age that is talked about by so many anthropologists and archaeologists. It is basically a reset of the entire world. It is, it is only, it's a 380 to 400 year old Dark Age. And it's only after, this, this one was so bad because 1687 BC, archaeologists and anthropologists, are, they're all convinced that Around 1650 BC, after this 25-year darkness, the whole world started waking up. And this is the ancient world that you've become familiar with. This is the Babylon, the Egypt, the Sumer. This is the, the ancient Argos. This is the ancient Israel. Uh, uh, this is the ancient China that you're familiar with. This is the version you find in the history books, in the, in the encyclopedias. But before 1687 BC, the world was way different. And the only reason we have any information about what happened prior to that is because the reset was so severe and it was so catastrophic and it, and it came so suddenly 
that it buried all the libraries of the ancient world. Had it not buried those cuneiform libraries, we wouldn't know all these details. We wouldn't know. Because in 1849, A.D. of our calendar, that's when we first started finding libraries perfectly intact under Babylon, Kalna, Rashamra, Ugarit. We found the Assyrian library of Ashurbanipal. 1849 began a hundred year period all the way to the 1950s when we began finding all these libraries underground. Why? Because all those cities were wiped out and buried. Having been wiped out is one thing, but to preserve all these libraries, which were once above ground, means that those civilizations were buried with rapidity or those libraries would have never been attacked. What libraries am I talking about? I'm talking about the 350,000 cuneiform tablet texts of Sumerian, Ugaritic, Ugaritic, Babylonian, Assyrian, and Hittite texts that we have today. So many, in fact, that the basements of the Ashmolean Museum, the Oxford Museum, the Princeton, and uh, what is it, London, England? I can't, maybe it's Oxford. That's Ashmolean. I'm, I'm missing one. But we have so many that those basements are still packed full of tablets that have not been translated for want of translators. So the resets are the reason why we have preserved this information. All that was buried, and now it's like all those all those buried cities have educated us because since the 1850s, George Smith and a host of others have been revealing to us what's been what the ancient world was really about. And I'm telling, like I told you in a prior presentation, guys, it's not what you think. The people who wrote these tablets were intellectual, were intellectuals. They were our equals today. And what I mean is, is the arithmetic that was applied, applied mathematics is so sophisticated, most of you listening to my voice would not be able to comprehend, even if those, even if their arithmetic was translated into the languages that we can translate, that we know today, the Arabic numeral system. If we were to look at some of the formulas that they were implying to understand how many bushels of wheat were, or could be carried by three ships that, that had a displacement value value of 40 tons each. This is what you find in the cuneiform, guys, displacement values. You have all kinds of stuff measured in gars and shars. This is what the cuneiform reveals to us. Only 5% of all those hundreds of thousands of tablets even deal with the Anunnaki, the Anuna, deal with the pre-flood world that even talk about gods and goddesses and concepts and cosmology. Only about 5%. 95% of the records of the ancient world that have been found are complex manifests, ship manifests, ledgers, whole lists of items, inventories, contracts, deeds. They're no different than what we find today in our legal libraries. Case decisions, case law, everything's in there. These people were very sophisticated. But when it came to talking about ancient history, they, they can only do it through primitive frames of reference. So, so it sounds childish when you're talking about the gods and different things going on. But what it is, is a, techno, is a very highly intelligent population remembering things through primitive filters that are far more sophisticated than those filters are able to convey. This is what we have to deal with when we're putting back the histories of the ancient world. We have to deal with the great flood of 2239 BC caused by the Phoenix. We have to deal with this massive filter that was placed there by history that keeps us from understanding how technologically advanced the pre-flood world really was. And the evidence we have is the Great Pyramid. All the nations of the world not, could not come together with their technologies and replicate that. And I have a list, I have a list of reasons why it can't be replicated. A Japanese company already tried to do it on one-tenth the scale. One-tenth the scale. And they gave up. They gave up. They couldn't even get, you understand, it's 203 levels, laser precision levels that go up. And each level is different, is a different height to earthquake proof it. So it would absorb shock as opposed to vibrate and crack up and all that. So 
Japanese company quit. One tenth the scale using modern machinery, modern equipment, modern science, and gave up. Yeah, they 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 lost all that money. We can't replicate that today. We don't even know what we don't even know what the adhesive is because there's an adhesive that was applied to all 2.5 million blocks on all six of their surfaces, and it's one fiftieth of an inch thick, and yet it has compounds we can identify, and it's stronger than the actual limestone blocks that 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 it, that it fused together. The adhesive is harder and more durable than the stone itself. So, yeah, we don't know what it is. And there's so many mysteries. I don't want to get off into the mysteries of the Great Pyramid. I got a whole playlist about that. So, we have 1687 BC. We have this massive filter, huge filter. Now we got to get through 1687 BC. The, about 95% of all the history of the world lost again. 25 year darkness, cannibalism, people are just trying to survive, and the scientific world doesn't even address it. All they say is, is that around 1650 BC, it seems like the whole ancient world just started waking up. Waking up from what? I can't get any of the encyclopedias to tell me. I've been looking and looking and looking. They never address the fact that it was a total systemic reset. They don't want to say it. They just say the whole world at the exact same time started started waking up. And the ancient world that you recognize today through Hollywood is the one that is post-Ogaijian flood. The Hollywood version of ancient history is after the 25-year darkness of 1687 B.C. That's the version you see in all the movies and all the Hollywood. But that's not the version of the ancient world, that 552-year period. Remember, that's a long time. Let me, let me explain. Just, just by way of example, just so I can hammer it in, it's 2024. It's 2024. 552 years ago was 1472. The world has changed a whole lot since, since 1472. In 1472, we didn't have these sophisticated sewer systems, canal works. We didn't have all these aircraft carriers, hadron colliders. In 1492, we didn't have asphalt and concrete laid out like snakes all over the land, everywhere and in every direction, crossing every county, every city, every town in the United States of America has these paved roads with lines on them everywhere. Street signs everywhere, electrical grid, infrastructure. In 1492, we didn't have anything like this in North America. North America is now absolutely packed full of cities. The majority of Americans go their entire life without leaving their city. The, the actual number of people who travel is, 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 not, is not high per capita. This infrastructure that we had didn't even take 200 years. 1472 wasn't any different as far as infrastructure goes than a hundred years later in 1572. No difference. 1672, no difference. 200 years of absolute undevelopment. It, the shipwrights, the shipping guilds, hardly anything changed. Anything changed in the in city building, in the building of cathedrals, nothing changed. Nothing. 1772. Uh, we have slight changes, but they're not, they're not much. We now have people messing with uh, 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 steam, steam technology and steam engines, but it's nothing big. But by 1872, the difference between 1782 and 1882 or 1872 is now profound because now steam engine and coal driven technologies fossil fuel technologies don't don't get triggered because i said fossil fuels oh my god you know what i'm talking about oil and gas even if it's derived from fossils or not it's still called fossil fuel technology whatever gas and fuel technologies combustion engine technologies are now everywhere in 1872 massive difference and by 19 72, we have the world we have today. As far as infrastructure goes, we have the world we have today. Now, the difference between 1972, computers existed in 1972, and so did cell phones. 1972. It just, it was the intelligence agencies and the government, government that had them. But now, here it is, 2024. 
this infrastructure we have is fickle and it can be reset in an instant in an instant so in putting back the ancient world we have to understand that if you're unable to see the ancient world through the filters that the ancient writers saw through you're going to have a lot of problems being a historian you're gonna have a lot you have it's only by acknowledging systemic resets and the inability of newer populations to process how advanced the prior populations were. It's That's the reason we get the historical record that's published in the official versions of encyclopedias and in textbooks. That's how they got that, but that's not the version we found in archaics to have existed. So all these... All these civilizations, though, were mariner civilizations. The entire history of the world is of civilizations spreading out, colonizing other areas by fleets of ships, everything. Even our oldest traditions, Oannes, the god Oannes. According to Babylonian mythologies, o Oannes looked fish-like, but that was only an illusion. Later writers said it's because he came by way of sea. That's not Jason telling you this. This is other writers who have interpreted the Babylonian versions of these events because they're seen through the correct frames of reference. Oannes arrived to the Near East by ship. He is Ea of the Sumerian records. Ea of the Sumerian records was merely a title for another deity that we know very well, Enki. Enki arrived by ship, bringing 50 Anuna. This is what started the, Sumer the Sumerian pantheon, the Sumer all the Sumerian stuff. So, yeah, as you guys know, it's 432,000 turnings of the stars before the Great Flood, which identifies... 3439 BC as the arrival of Enki, which perhaps it's a coincidence, guys. Maybe it's just a coincidence. But in the biblical chronology, as I've shown in archaics, verified from multitudes of sources, Enoch appeared in the year 456 Annus Mundi. Well, 456 Annus Mundi is the same year in the BC calendar is 3439 BC. So is Enoch, who was a mathematician, an architect, builder of the Great Pyramids, is Enoch the same as Enki? I don't know. You decide. There's a whole lot, there's a whole lot more evidence for, for identifying the two as the same, but you know what? A lot of people are triggered by that identity as well because they haven't looked at the chronographical material. But all the great civilization builders they have a common denominator. After resets, a hero appears. This hero appears and brings others just like him who have knowledge in metallurgy. They have knowledge in, uh, uh, they, they know how to, they're masters of woodworking, carpentry, building scaffolds, infrastructure, jewelry. They're, uh, they, they, they know everything about weapons and armor. <coughs> Excuse me. They've got the technology down pat. It is the story that has been retold every reset. Enki Oannes is no different. He was, according to Babylon, Babylon, he was a civilization builder. He brought civilization to a primitive people who had lost everything. That was Oannes. That was Enki. After, after the Great Flood, it was who? It was Neruus. Neruus is very cleverly put out of the way, but he can be seen on the on the Parthenon in Greece, which shows all which shows the wars of the Titans and Giants. And Neruus is in the background with his daughters, the Nereids. He's the old man of the sea, but he was the survivor, survivor of the flood. Other cultures identified Nereus as Nereus as Deucalion, Impera, his wife, survivor of the flood, builder of civilization. What about Dano Danos? Danos was the same way. In Greek mythology, Danos was the twin brother of Gopt. Who is Gopt? In the Greek, he's Egyptus. Egypt, the father of the Danides. This, he was the leader of the Danan. The Danan arrived by fleet from a, to a cataclysm torn Egypt, and they arrived in ancient Greece, and they became the feared Danan. 
the Danan fleets went to the Levant and settled there, and they became they became what was later known as the tribe of Dan. It's the exact same people. The Danan then sailed right through the pages of Homer's Odyssey when Agamemnon needed help against the state of Troy, the Trojan state. Ilium was powerful. It was a part. It was a finger of the Hittite authority, and the Hittites were governing all access to the Black Sea, and they were doing it through the fleets of Troy. And the story of the, the fall of Troy and the Trojan War is the story of how the Danan, who came from Egypt and settled in Israel, how the Danan agreed to, to lend their military fleets, their prowess, to Mycenaean king Agamemnon. And by using the Danan, he defeated the Trojans. This is how it was done. So... <clears throat> He was a civilization founder and a builder, and this is what he's known for in ancient Achaia. But what about sea crops? Sea crops fled Egypt when Egypt was destroyed after a reset, and he became the king of Athens. He became the king of Athens, and it's and it's dated, uniformly dated in the 14th century BC, which is really interesting because the Atlantis story could have never happened before that. Atlantis story of Plato requires that Athens be a participant because Athens was the enemy of the, of the Atlanteans. The Atlanteans fought a war against Athens. This is all in Plato's narrative. But people like Graham Hancock keep pushing this Atlantis BS chronology all the way to 9,600 BC, and it doesn't make any sense. It's anachronistic, and it completely defies all, all the other information. I have a full list published right here on my channel in my video critiquing Graham Hancock's dating of Atlantis that shows all the archaeological things that are mentioned by Plato that could have never happened at 10,000 BC. They must have happened in the 13th century BC when Athens was flourishing and they were attacked by the Sea People's Federation. Imagine that. Where did the Sea Peoples come from? Well, this is how the Egyptians got cocaine in their tombs. This is how the Egyptians got all kinds of Central American animals in their reliefs. This is how the Egyptians got, got coffee in, 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 the, in, in the mummies, cocaine mummies and coffee in their teeth. This is how so many American th ancient things in America suddenly appeared in Egypt. Two different invasions of the Sea Peoples attacked Egypt, and they were repelled. Many of them were captured, and in their ships were found all kinds of things, trophies from the Americas. This is how the Philistines appeared in, in right there in the Levant area. They, they, were, they were unable to take Egypt, so they just settled right there and built five cities called the Pentopolis. It's the Philistine Pento, uh, Pentopolis. Gaza was one of those cities. From the feet, they were ancient Americans. So these were the Atlanteans, and the, Atlante the Atlanteans were at war. And who do they fight against? Athens. Who do they come and destroy? Troy. What's, what empire fell when the Sea People's Federation showed up on the scene? The Hittites, all of them wiped out. So it was sea crops that came from Egypt and settled ancient, the ancient Aegean and built Athens. And the Atlantis story could only come after sea, sea crops built that city. So Cadmus, what about Cadmus? Cadmus too. Cadmus came from Israel. He was a Phoenician. According to the Greeks, he came and founded the Greek city of Thebes which kind of hints that he may have been in, in Africa as well, because the older city of Thebes is Egyptian. Now, uh, Cadmus, his sister was named what? Europa. This is, how, this is how Europe was named. Europe was named from a Phoenician that had come from the Levant area and settled ancient Greece. So all of this happened before the Great Mediterranean Dark Age reset caused by Typhon. Who is Typhon to the Greeks? He is Egypt. I'm um, excuse me, he's Phoenix, mentioned over and over by ancient authors, the great and feared Typhon dragon that had destroyed Egypt over and over and over is no different than the Greek Phoenix. They are one and the same. They are identified uniformly as the same thing by many ancient authors. So we have we have a, a Cadmus showing in bringing the alphabet to Greece. The alphabet is brought by a Phoenician who just survived a systemic reset. So Aeneas appears. 
This is the Roman version. Aeneas is a Trojan hero. After the fall of Troy, Aeneas, Aeneas appears and he brings his people to the Italian peninsula. The Italian, the, this is how the Romans, the, Ro, the Romans claim that their history unfolded. So this is uh, the the story is in the Aeneid. It's pretty interesting, but <clears throat> this is also where other other survivors from the Trojan War they flee to the north in their ship in their ships and they're following a man named Brutus and another man named uh, Corneus. And this is how Cornwall is is established and also a uh, Britain. When Brutus lands, he already finds a population there. This is the story of great civilization founders in every single incident. Brutus, Aeneas, Coroneus, Cadmus, Cecrops, Danaos, Oannes, in every single story, they are leaving a cataclysm-torn world. When they reappear, it's always a population that is more primitive, easier to control, and they come in and, and they start ruling and they start building their dynasty. The story is the same. The players are all different. The geographical areas are different, but the story is the same every single time. Enter 1135 B.C. 1135 BC, the civilization of the Sea People's Federation is wiped out. How do we know? Because we have things like the uh, uh, the Mer the Mernepta. I can't pronounce it. It's Egyptian steel called Mernepta, the Mernepta steel, which mentioned which which has an it has a mention of ancient Israel, but it talks about the Sea People's Federation. Also, the Medinet, uh, Medinet Habu Temple has the histories of the Sea Peoples on the walls. This is where we get our information about Ramesses and the war against the Sea People's Federation. How do we know that 1135 BC ended them? Because there's not a single appearance of the Sea Peoples ever again after this date. And the story that attaches to the Sea Peoples is Plato's Atlantis. Cataclysm. Mediterranean Dark Age begins 1135 BC. It is 552 years after the Ogygian Deluge. Everything is wiped out. S systemic reset. Only after, hundreds of years after, do we have a whole new, a whole new infrastructure being built. Hundreds of years after the Great Mediterranean Dark Age ends, hundreds of years after Atlantis is gone, do we have, all of a sudden, Hesiod appears with his Theogony. Homer appears with his Iliad, describing what the events that led up to the Great Mediterranean Dark Age. Homer comes out with his Odyssey about Odysseus, the ship navigator who man traveled the ancient world doing all kinds of things. What, what do we have? We have, um, uh, let's say, Hesiod, Homer. We have Theognis. Theognis has his Theogony. Um, we have these, we have um, uh, works and days. We have these ancient, the very first Greek writers are putting out these cosmolo cosmological epics. We don't. Ha we have this vast gulf of nothing out of a dark age, centuries. Then all of a sudden, these great epics appear. Then after the great epics appear, then the poets appear. Then we have all these writings of Aristophanes and the birds and Pindar and, we, and all these massive writings. And then suddenly, in 776 BC, out of the ancient Olympiad system of four-year periods, we have the official beginning of the Greek Olympiad calendar. The Greeks start pulling themselves out of the great Mediterranean Dark Age. 776 BC is year one of the Greek Olympiad calendar. Right after that, in the same generation, 753 BC begins the first year of Rome. The Roman monarchy, the seven kings of Rome begin. This is what it's called. The seven kings of Rome begin in 753 BC with Romulus. We have we have we have uh, the Greek calendar. We have the Roman calendar. Soon after that, we have the Pythian calendar. We have all these calendars in the ancient world. The Saka calendar. They all begin begin starting after the Great Mediterranean Dark Age. But now, now Greek mythology has appeared, and Greek mythology is really unusual. It is very dense in details. It's very packed with so much inter intermingling and, 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 and meshing of concepts. And yet, 
It's profound. And the reason it's profound is because Greek mythology is the result of a very intelligent population that knows that these stories have everything to do with real events in the ancient past, but their frames of reference have become so, so primitive because they have no idea what technology even is. None. So, as these things are transmitted through century and century, especially through the Great Mediterranean Dark Age, which was the third systemic reset. It was the third. The Great Mediterranean Dark Age, before that was the Ogygian Deluge and 25-year darkness. Before that was the Great Flood of 2239 BC, which was a total collapse to everything, everywhere in the world. So through three massive resets, there has been a complete separation of, of concepts and ideas that could have ever even put been put together by these people of a technologically advanced society. It took our society today, looking in retrospect at these concepts to understand that, damn, they're talking about some really sophisticated things in these, in these myths and these legends. They're just doing it from a, from a child's perspective because that's the only perspective they maintain concerning these advanced concepts. So it's a, this is what we have. This is what we have with the Great Mediterranean Dark Age in the Sea People's Federation. It was total systemic systemic reset. I'm not saying Atlantis wasn't real. I'm telling you it was. I'm just telling you that Graham Hancock and everybody else who is attached to the 9,600 year BC deal defies all the historical and archaeological data. And this isn't Jason of Archaics telling you this. My free PDF download of all the data points on the dating of Atlantis comes from prestigious scholars and academics and ancient authors that Graham Hancock has to ignore in order to perpetuate the, the whole idea that Atlantis was 9,600 BC. Graham Hancock has to commit academic fallacy deceit in order to do that because the overwhelming amount of information that dates Atlantis at the 13th century BC completely overwhelms anybody's ability to support an Atlantis at 9,600 BC. So much so that I'm very confident that Graham Hancock listening to my voice right now is still not going to call me out for a debate on it. That's how confident I am in the data. And you should be too. I provided that PDF free. Anybody can download it from that video. And Mr. Hancock knows this as well. 9,600 BC dating to the Younger Dryas period, which itself, you guys, you have to understand, guys, Ice Age theory is not, is not fact. It's theory. And the Younger Dryas impact theory is, the, is just that. It is, it is not even accepted by the scientific community. It is still theory because it has so many holes it cannot fill. So yeah, I get off my little tangent there. So yeah, anybody wants to know more about the Sea People's Federation, there are two good sources, the Maranapta uh, Steel and the Mednet, the Temple of Mednet Habu. Habu. And there's a lot of academic papers that have been published about the Sea People's Federation. But I'm going to tell you now, you can avoid going through all the minutia and you want to get the story straight. You should you should look at Frank Joseph's books on the Sea People's Federation. Frank Joseph is a historian. I got a lot of respect for him. So we have... Uh, <coughs> Our world is built, our world is built on the backs of these ships. The, the, the Heliolithic Maritime Empire wasn't the first. It wasn't the first. And all the different navies and all the civilization uh, builders that took all their populations by fleets, they weren't, they weren't. Even Israel, a lot of people don't know this. I have it documented in Chronicon for anybody to see. But even Israel, before the 10 tribes were deported and lost to European history, even Israel in the Old Testament suffered four famines. In those famines, the Old Testament is very clear what happened. Israelites, whole families and communities got together and they went to Phoenicia. They went to Tyre and Sidon and they went to 
Ionia, Miletus, the old, their old Israelite cousins. They went to the old ships of, of Ionia, I mean, the old cities of Ionia, and they paid for passage or they built and financed fleets of ships four times in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, Israel and Ionia exported whole Israelite fleets that disappeared into the Mediterranean. Four different times, Israelite fleets vanished into the Mediterranean. Did they really vanish? No. I also document in Chronicon where they appeared, where they appeared in Gaul, where they appeared in Nicomedia, where they appeared in Bithynia, where they appeared in Armenia, where they appeared in Hungary, where these fleets actually landed and then built whole civilizations that became known as somebody else. People who, just like the prophecies in the Old Testament say, People who would go to new lands, new shores, new islands, build new countries that would become new empires. People who would suffer the curse of Ephraim. What is the curse of Ephraim? It's to forget who you are. These people would walk in darkness not knowing their pedigree. They would completely forget their identity. And, they would be, and their descendants would become great empires. All of this has been fulfilled. But that's a subject for other videos. So we have we have we have a lot of mariner activity that describes. Uh oh, there's 776, Merrill. I see it. <coughs> the uh, we have a lot of mariner activity that has built the present infrastructure, and it goes back far. The Phoenician circumnavigation of Africa, few people know around 600 BC, the Phoenicians left us records that they circumnavigated all of Africa. This is in 600 BC, uh, uh, commissioned by Pharaoh Necho, this, uh, it's Necho or Necho II of Egypt. That was commissioned by him. Hanno, the navigator, a hundred years later out of Car ancient Carthage, he took a fleet of 60 ships. Hanno took 60 ships and he explored the entire West African coast. He reached as far south as Sierra Leone. He may have went further. We don't know. Greek exploration and, and colonization to the 8th to 6th century BC. This is after they started coming out of the great Mediterranean dark age. Now Greek navigators are going everywhere. They're exploring everything all the way up into the Black Sea. The reset happened everywhere. The entire world. So it wasn't like they feared coming into contact with more advanced or or or, or deal. They were, they were they were the they were just equal to everybody else. The entire world was reset back to basically year one. So we have a uh, uh, all of Sicily, uh, uh, southern Italy, all the way through the Black Coast. Greeks were building colonies. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that Italy isn't just Roman. There's a whole Greek colony that's been there since since the beginning a whole massive Greek state right there in Italy. So uh, I know a lot of you know about, you've learned about this in college, the voyage of Pythias. Pythias around 330. Alexander the Great was alive when Pythias did this. Uh, the voyage of Pythias, he was a Greek geographer from Messia. Yeah, Mas it's, mo it's modern day Marseille. I don't know how the Greek pronunciation is. Massalia, Massilia. I don't know, but it's modern day Marseille. And uh, he made it all the way to the British Isles. And he even wrote about an, an unusual Hyperborean temple that was in the British Isles. He wrote about that. It might be the first historical citation of Stonehenge. But he wrote about it. Oh, he also went as far as Tool, which probably, I think that's what, Sweden, Denmark area, something like that. But uh. Alexander the Great's Indian campaign involved whole fleets of ships. Matter of fact, didn't they burn the ships to give a message that man, I'm I'm not I'm not coming back without victory. So, uh, what about uh Periplus, Periplus of the Erythian Sea, first century BC? Uh, I don't think it was a single voyage. That was multiple voyages, but it was it was popular. Um, um. We're talking about sailing from the Mediterranean and making it all the way to the Indian Sea, the Sea, the sea of India. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Indian Ocean. So I said Sea of India. I mean, Indian Ocean. Hmm. So Eudoxus. Now, Eudoxus of Nidus, uh, I've already told you, 
in prior presentations, Eudoxus of Nidos, just like Diodorus Siculus, he knew Plato made a mistake. They published this over 2,000 years ago that Plato aired and it wasn't 9,000 years. That's how Graham Hancock, that's the only evidence Graham Hancock goes by. The mistake of Plato, 9,600 BC. Eudoxus of Nidos and Diodorus Siculus said it was 9,000 months. It's the only way the Egyptians calculated time. That's why in Egyptian records and papyri, we have these long convoluted dates, 23,000 years and all that, but it never says years. It's just 20, 23,000 units. Yeah, it, the, the Egyptians counted by months. This is exactly what Diodorus Siculus said. He said that a year to the Egyptians was a month. That's a direct quote. And Eudoxus of Nidos corrected Plato and said it was 9,000 moons, not years, which puts it at the 13th century BC, the Sea People's Federation. But here we have Eudoxus. Eudoxus was known, too, as being a, a Greek navigator, and he sailed all the way. He, he attempted a sail from India back to Europe around the southern tip, tip of Africa. So this he attempted it, but he got beached. Had to walk along, had to traverse across land for a long distance. But this shows that they understood in the in the years of Eudoxus, they understood that you could sail from India all the way to the Mediterranean, to Greece. You could sail it by going around Africa. You didn't have to cross the Atlantic like like the Portuguese, the Genoans, and the Spanish. Uh, the Spanish believed that you had to go across the Atlantic to get to India. No, you could go. You can go around the Horn of Africa. So uh, we're missing one. Uh, around 500 BC, we have Skylax. Skylax did the same thing. He was commissioned by the Persian king Darius, but he too explored the Indian, the, uh, the Indian Ocean, and all the way to the Red Sea, Indian Ocean. He opened up trade routes, established the Persian dominance of the Indian subcontinent. Yeah, he did that. Oh, we missed one even further back than that. I can't believe I missed this one. Oh. Uh, I can't even believe I missed Jason and the Argonauts. Uh, did anybody mention that already? I can't even believe I missed, missed that. Jason and the Argonauts is a, a, it's a story that goes in, hand in hand with another ancient Greek story. As a matter of fact, it concerns uh, the Greeks themselves be, claim that their history actually began with an incident called the Seven Against Thebes. This is interesting. According to ancient Greek authors, their history began. The history of the Greek world began with an incident called the Seven Against Thebes, where seven cities brought their armies and they fought against the city of Thebes. What's interesting about this is the same Greek authors say that while this begins Greek history, the uh, uh, the participants, the participants of the the battle of the Seven Against Thebes. Either one or two of them was on the on the Argo with Jason, or or two of the people on the Argo had sons that were participating. Anyway, it was within a generation. It, the the according to the Greeks, the story of Jason and the Argonauts was was a generation before the Seven Against Thebes, and the Seven Against Thebes is the only Greek historical. story story that's that that's considered to begin Greek history because the next Greek story after that is the fall of Troy. Then what happens? The great Mediterranean dark age. Yeah guys it's crazy. It's crazy how all this fits together. Fits together. Oh uh, see Pliny the Elder in his book Natural History which we'll be going through pretty soon. I got me a t-shirt says Pliny the Elder and a big old deal on the back and I have a copy of Pliny, Pliny's uh, natural history. We're going to go through it on YouTube because he, he, he documents some really interesting stuff. So it's a famous book, but uh, he too was a navigator. Pliny the elder sure was. Uh, he was a Royal Na Naval, he was a Roman Royal Naval commander for a while. He, he left us a book called Nat natural history, but, uh, there's just so many incidents, the Viking expeditions. You already know about the Viking expeditions. Some of you guys know about St. Brendan in the 6th century. St. Brend Brendan, the navigator, an Irish monk who uh, supposedly went to North America, across the Atlantic, uh, to the land of promise. Um, there is evidence of this because there is evidence of Welsh and Irish 
who have settled North America. And it may be the origin of the Mandan Indians because the Mandan Indians have blonde and red hair and green and blue eyes, white skin, and yet their and yet their culture is 100% uh, indigenous Native American. And yet many of the words, many of the words among the Mandan though, are traced to Old Welsh. Uh, well, I mean, we've all heard the stories of the great Arab and Persian voyages and. Uh, different Arab heroes and stuff, and uh, the Arabian Nights, you know, the, the voyages in the Arabian Nights, the Chinese exped expeditions of the 15th century where whole fleets were sent all over the world. Our world today, guys, was built on the backs of these navigators. Uh, much, of, much of our vernacular comes from the maritime law. It comes from the maritime lifestyle. Uh, the Chinese in 1433 had, had sent fleets out from 1405 to 1433. They sent fleets all over the world. Most people don't know this about China. They did this, and they did it at the height of empire, and they were doing it to show off. They had zoos. They had treasure ships they were sending to show off to other nations. Yeah, guys, China did this. 15th century. Uh, we have the travels of Ibn Battuta in the 14th century. This guy, this guy covered 75,000 miles of the world's surface by land and by ship. This man went everywhere. It's called the travels of Ibu, uh, Ibn, ba Ibn Battuta. Oh, I got a refill. Get my re get my coffee refill, dance. Thanks. Thank you. Got that. Man. Love that coffee. So, uh, what about uh, we know Mar Marco Polo? We we all know about Marco Polo, and uh, maybe some people don't know about Mar uh, Bartho Bartholomew Diaz, Portuguese explorer. Listen, guys, it's the same recent. It's the same civilization. It's the same story again of sea crops of Ogyges. It's the, I, I forgot to mention Ogyges earlier. I just talked about the Ogygian deluge, but Ogyges was a civilization founder too after a reset. And then his whole infrastructure collapsed, called the Ogygian Deluge. But uh, 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 like Cecrops and Danaeus and Aeneas and, and uh, Brutus and Corneus, uh, Bartholomew uh, Dias, Portuguese explorer. What did the Portuguese and Spanish explorers turned conquistadors find? They found indigenous, more primitive cultures who regarded them as technologically advanced. Christopher Columbus, John Ke John Cabot, Giovanni, his name is Giovanni, but we call him John Cabot, Italian explorer. Uh, Vasco da Gama, America Vespucci, Ferdinand Magellan, Hernan Cortez, yeah, conquered the Aztecs. Yeah, he didn't really conquer anybody, but... Uh, yeah, guys, uh, Francisco Pizarro, Jacques Cartier. Uh, did I say that right? Look. Look, guys, they all did the same thing that the ancients did. They showed up having their infrastructure intact. They showed up among a primitive po population. And what did they do? They changed the entire histories and trajectory of the Americas. That's what they did. That's why all these... That's why all these 40 or something countries in Central America and South America and even Mexico, North America, identify with Spanish and Portuguese. This is why. So they weren't Spanish and they weren't Portuguese. But this is why they identify with them now. Sir Francis Drake, Henry Hudson. Yeah. I don't know Henry Hudson. Uh, a, I don't know Abel Tasman. I have Abel Tasman on my list here. Oh, Dutch. Oh, I, how, how did I not know that? The Dutch East India Company. Man, how did I not know that? Oh, uh, one of my videos, I go into a lot of detail about James Cook and his first experiences with the Aboriginals of Australia. It's really interesting how the Aboriginals thought he was a ghost. Yeah, it's crazy. It's all crazy. So when I was in prison. I had read some fantastic fiction, but these all these books they tap into this 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 whole mariner mariner type infrastructure that we live in today. We're still in it. Our world today was built on the backs of ships. 
shipped. Robinson Crusoe. Many of you have read Daniel Defoe. I have. Robinson Crusoe is like 17, 20 or something like that. I know a lot of you have read Gulliver's Travels. Gulliver's Travels is like sci-fi in the old world. It's crazy. But Gulliver's Travels is another book that conveys just how much today our world is built from the backs of ships. It's a, I forgot Homer's Odyssey. Homer, Homer, yeah. I think I mentioned Homer's Odyssey, didn't I? Moby Dick. Herman Melville. Absolute classic. Moby Dick is a page turner. It's a page turner. So the whole idea of a ship, guys, the whole idea of a ship is the reason I'm wearing this shirt. The idea and concept of a ship. Inside the construct, the ship is the ark that carries people and their possessions and the things that they need as sustenance through a cataclysm, through a reset. The ship is the vessel that takes you to a new world. The Great Pyramid as a ark is the vessel that contains everything important about that world to a future population that has arrived to a future destination that can look back and decipher that complex data. The construct is just a place we are passing through. The construct requires us to have an arc that allows us to navigate through it, or we can't. It's impossible to navigate through the construct without an arc. We're just passing through, but the we that is passing through requires a vessel in order to navigate this experience. Treasure Island was another good one. I, I suggest that when it comes to the classics, I love them because they put you in the old world. You got to start thinking like they did. We have, I mean, we have our groceries delivered now, for Christ's sakes. These people had to chase a rabbit with a spear. Changes your perspective. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Jules Verne is one of the greatest writers of all time because he knew. He knew. He knew that the, the things of importance have been preserved by somebody in the underworld. And that somebody has routinely sent provisions to the surface to continue civilization while also remaining separate from it. He knew. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, the submarine. Yeah, guys. All the stuff in that story, there are so many drops in that story about the real reality we're living in now. Jules Verne knew. It's not the only one. Jules Verne wrote other books where he revealed, well, what didn't, wasn't he the author of a, a voyage, voyage to the Middle of the Earth or something like that? So many drops in Jules Verne. The man knew. He understood. He understood. That, that, you know, you understand, you guys know, my Archaics veterans know, I operate by a tenant. If anything is true sometime, it's true somewhere all the time. So, since technology existed in the ancient world, and technology exists today, it's always existed somewhere. It just wasn't available to everyone. Now... Um, let's see. I know some of you have read uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Edgar Allan Poe has some stories too that are reset stories. They're stories of shipwrecks and and uh, uh, stories of um, Pawtucket, Pawtucket. Some of you, someone's going to mention it here. Edgar Allan Poe had a Pawtucket st story or something about a shipwreck. We'll get it. So, um, 
I mean, you, these are this is the this is the lifestyle, man. That the Mariner life. Remember my video on William Corliss's anomalies and all the things that have been seen under the water, the the luminaries in tidal waves and tsunamis. It has been reported that a glowing yellow or white orb has been seen in tsunamis as the tsunamis came in. Remember the video footage I showed of that white specter that came out of that tidal wave and then went up the buildings and then flew off. So creepy, so creepy. The Flying Dutchman. It's another story like that, like that. The Mary Celeste, very popular story about a derelict ship where all the passengers were just missing. They're gone. They're gone. So this world, the entire history of the world is one of people passing from one world to another by ship. The entire history of the world punctuated by these systemic resets. Shiva, Shiva, right, Nantucket. What did I say? I said something else. You're right. That's right. Edgar Allan Poe, Nantucket. That's the one. That's the one. I said something else. But you're right. Um. So, if you know, start listing them in the chat. But if you know, we have a lot of modern terms, modern colloquials today that come straight out of this navigator history that we have. The entire history of the world is one of fleets of ships just trying to survive from one destroyed world to a new world where we've rebuilt. This is why our vernacular, this is why our legal terms, this is why many of our medical terms, this is why our architectural terms, this is why so our everyday colloquials, they stem from maritime periods, maritime concepts, even admiral, even the, ad, was it, the admiralty law. That's why it was where it all comes from. It's because this history that we have. This is this concept of an arc, and the arc is carrying something. This is where it all derives from. You guys know the term above board? Oh, yeah, man. It, yeah, it looks above board to me. Above board comes straight out of sailor parlance. Straight out of sailor parlance. But it's above board. It came straight from, from, from sailor. This is a sailor's term. Just like uh, batting down the hatches. Hey, man, hey, guys, you know what? We got a tornado coming. Uh, tornado warning. We need to go ahead and batten down the hatches. Yeah, then you're telling the whole family, hey man, let's get everything ready. Let's seal the windows, let's close the doors, let's get everything, get everybody safe. You gotta batten down the hatches. It's become a modern colloquial, but man, it meant it meant something serious to sailors who needed to batten down the hatches. Yeah. Uh little simple colloquials like by and large. By and large. Yeah. People say these things all the time, not knowing this came straight out of sailors' mouths. It was it was a mariner term hundreds of years ago, maybe thousands of years ago, by and large. That's right. Oh, somebody said the birth canal. I don't know if that's right or not, but yeah, birth canal. Birth. Oh, uh, a clean slate. A clean slate comes right out right out of the mariner. Mariner. I have the definitions here. The ship's course and distance were recorded on a slate. At the end of the watch, if there were no incidents, the slate was wiped clean for the next watch. Got it. That's how they reported different things they saw on the horizon. The guys in the crow's nest. Yeah, clean slate. That makes sense. Nothing to report. We just clean the slate. I got it. Okay, cut and run. If a ship was in immediate danger, the crew might cut the anchor rope and sail away quickly instead of taking the time to haul up the anchor. It was called cut and run to avoid trouble. Yeah, we do. We, we talk about that all the time. Cut and run. Here's one that shocked me. Footloose. The bottom portion of a sail is called the foot. If it is not secured, it is footloose. And it flaps about inefficiently. Man. Tell that dude in the 80s who did the movie Footloose about that. That's your foot flopping around. That's it right there. Footloose and fancy free. That's a good one. Here's one that surprised me. I didn't think to find slush fund. Slush fund is a popular term today in economics. I didn't, didn't even know it derived from the ship. The slush referred to the fat or grease collected from boiling salted meat. 
which the ship's cook would sell at port. This money was then used for the crew's benefit, such as purchasing small luxuries. Today, a slush fund is a reserve of money for different purposes. That's pretty cool. Slush fund came from ships. Yeah. Who are we? That's a good little good little old handle you got there. Who are we? Said hold fast. That's right. You're right. Hold fast. You're absolutely correct. This is one that everybody should know. Taken aback. Yeah, I was taken aback by that. Taken aback was all used by sailors. Taken aback. Yeah. If the ship sails suddenly filled with wind from the wrong direction, it could be taken aback, which was a dangerous situation. Yeah. Ordinarily, uh, if all the inertia of a heavy ship with a, with a high displacement value was moving in one direction and suddenly the sail started going, I'm going to tell you now, that almost always resulted with the splintering of the mast or masts. Yeah, because it's a ship doesn't just change. It just can't. It's way too much weight and way too much inertial momentum going in one direction. The sails, they just break the mast. Taken aback. I was taken aback. Oh, here's another one. Three sheets to the wind. In nautical terms, a sheet is a rope that controls the tension on the edges of a sail. All right. If three sheets were loose and blowing about in the wind, the sail would flap uncontrollably and the ship would stagger like a drunken sailor. There it is. Three sheets to the wind came from the sailors. It's all interesting, guys. Here's one I'm familiar with. It comes from... Uh, um. I used to spend a lot of time in the law library in prison. And one of the things that demur, demur, and demurrer is you'll find that everywhere in tort law. You find this all, all the time. You got to file a demur or, or the demur is incorrect or improperly stated. It's not verified. So anyway, here it is right here. It came straight out of the maritime law as well or, or, or maritime parlance. Demurrage a term used in shipping contracts to refer to the penalty for exceeding the agreed time for loading or unloading cargo. That's why it's in tort law. That's why it's in tort law. Tort, torts concern responsibilities. Interesting, guys. Interesting, guys. Oh, flotsam and jetsam. There it is. Flotsam and jetsam. We all knew, we all knew that was from maritime. Okay. Here's one everybody should know. Thank you for that 1380. Appreciate it. Here's one. Let me catch my chat because you guys are probably offering some I'm missing. Tons of verbiage in the bar exam. I agree, Jamie, because the, yeah, the legal stuff, that all comes from the maritime law. There's no doubt. Statue of Liberty, a.k.a. Apollo. Hey, that's did you get that from me or did you come across that somewhere else? Because I've been telling people the Statue of Liberty is not a female. The Statue of Liberty is Apollo. I've been telling people that. It also has 168 steps. And you count those 168 steps up to the torch and add it to the year that the Statue of Liberty was dedicated in, in the harbor, you get the year 2052, which is when liberty is taken from the earth. Oh, yeah, guys, I got a lot of this on my channel. Interesting. Thank you for that. Statue of Liberty is Apollo. That's all I read in your comment, and it triggered me. Wow. Interesting. So, okay. Oh, taking the prize. Taking the prize. Taking the prizes from the old sailor, sailor days when they took a ship. Yeah, if the Portuguese were at war with, 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 the, with the Germans or, or with the English, if they, if they captured the ship, they would bring they would bring the sailors over to 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 uh wherever their home port was and and they would turn them into the authorities. But the ship itself, they had to pay a fee for the ship because they took a prize. The prize is they get to keep that ship. They get to keep that ship. However, they have to pay like a tax to the to the crown uh for for the right to keep that ship. And sometimes you know sometimes the prize if if the ship wasn't uh, if the captain of the ship was like under the authority of the crown, then the prize belonged to the crown. The, and the ship would become owned by that, by that, by that, by that king in that navy. But yeah, taking the prize—it's awesome. 
Salvage rights, yeah. That, that makes sense. Salvage rights is the same thing, taking a prize. That's all interesting. So, been going almost two hours here, but guys, some of our religious terms, some of our, some of the terms straight out of the Bible comes from this, this whole history that we share. We all, everybody listening to my voice, we all share this history, this history of our ancestors suffering reset after reset after reset after reset and every time finding new lands and new places to dwell by ship fleets landing and oftentimes coming across indigenous populations that didn't have near the technology that we did so oh uh, we have we have different terms and metaphors that are that are used in in religious context today. Not all of them are in the Bible. Some of them are, are used you know, by preachers and all that, like nav navigating navigating life life storms. Come on, man, that's straight out of sailor parlance. Oh, uh, the whole idea that the anchor is a symbol for hope. Yeah, it's a symbol for hope and steadfastness. That would come straight straight out of of uh. Matter of fact, in the book of Hebrews, one of you guys can find it, but in the book of Hebrews, the, the anchor is used for a sign of stability and hope. I think it's in a spiritual context, but uh, uh, this is why a lot of the older Christian and alchemical architecture uh, has an anchor everywhere. It is a symbol for hope, and I know it's in the book of Hebrews somewhere that there's a, uh, the anchor is used as a, as a it's, I think it's a spiritual symbol of steadfastness or 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 stability, or something like that. Um, what about fisher of men? I will, hey, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Well, you're not going to be a fisher of men without a boat. You got to have a fisher boat. You got to have an ark, and that ark is your vehicle on how to how to pass through the construct. As you're passing through the construct, you can be a fisher of men. Uh, another another good colloquial, another good term. That's that's uh. That's been there. I know somebody's going to find that in, in Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews. I was just seeing if anybody anybody looked it up. I know somebody's going to see it. Anchor is used as some type of spiritual symbol in the book of Hebrews. Anyway, uh, guiding light. I will be your guiding light, or you can be a guiding light. Again, where's that? That's a lighthouse. That, that refers to a lighthouse. Thank you, Sound Sessions. It's at 552. But yeah, Guiding Light is another one, guys. Uh, Sarcastic Warlock. I have the book, Atlantis Edda, and the Atlantis Edda and Bible by Herman White. I just haven't read it yet. 1926, I have the book. I just I haven't had time, time to get into it yet. I will get into a lot of my books after I after I finish organizing Chronicon and I'm satisfied with that. Because then I got to start getting all the material out of all these books and add it, add it into Chronicon where it fits. Guiding light's a good one. Uh, another modern steering the course. We all know you got to steer a boat. Steering the course is a very ancient saying that re that revised uh, all that. Uh, also a uh, a ship of faith. Uh, safe harbor. All these are colloquials. All these are modern colloquials that have been borrowed over and over in the spiritual community. A whole bunch of them. But yeah, it's all. There's there's probably a lot more. I just can't think of them. But I do know a real good one that has everything to do with the archaics concept and has everything to do with the vessel that's that's needed to pass through a construct because a construct isn't necessarily real. So I'm going to close with with something that's not necessarily real, but every everybody listening to my voice has heard this. Everybody, what? Some of you could probably guess what it is. Let me pull this up real quick. How many of you know this song? 
Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream.